The Sign of Four Foreword by Stephen Fry One of the most significant dinners in literary history took place at London's Langham Hotel on the 30th of August in the year 1889. Like many good stories, it concerns an assortment of nationalities, in this case a Scotsman, an Irishman, and an American. The American was the host. His name was Joseph M. Stoddart, and he was the managing editor of Lippincott's magazine, a literary publication issued monthly in the United States. Stoddart, as the Hollywood moguls were to be three or four decades later, was hungry for content to feed the periodical, and a slew of British talent was just what he felt he needed to lend Lippincott's prestige. With the nose for talent that such impresarios always seem to have, he approached the 35-year-old Irishman Oscar Wilde and asked him to attend his dinner. He extended an invitation also to the Scotsman Arthur Conan Doyle. A promising English author was asked too, but couldn't make it. That was the 24-year-old Rudyard Kipling, who would nonetheless go on to produce a novel for Lippincott's The Light That Failed. In his 1924 autobiography, Memories and Adventures, Doyle refers to the 1889 dinner with Wilde and Stoddart as a golden evening. He and Wilde hit it off straight away after Wilde complimented Doyle on his historical novel Micah Clark. There was no surer way to Doyle's heart than that. He confessed to being amazed and flattered that the famous literary Irishman, the toast of intellectual salons in London and Paris, had even heard of the book, let alone read it. In the relevant passage in his memoirs, Doyle spent some time analysing Wilde's character and effect, which he admired enormously from the outset. He had never been in the company of a greater speaker. His conversation left an indelible impression upon my mind, he wrote. He towered above us all, and yet had the art of seeming to be interested in all that we could say. He had delicacy of feeling and tact, for the monologue man, however clever, can never be a gentleman at heart. He took as well as gave, but what he gave was unique. He had a curious precision of statement, a delicate flavour of humour, and a trick of small gestures to illustrate his meaning, which were peculiar to himself. The effect cannot be reproduced. Such were Stoddart's gifts of flattery, coercion, and enthusiasm that he managed to commission each writer to produce a new work of fiction for his magazine. As Doyle put it, the result of the evening was that both Wilde and I promised to write books for Lippincott's magazine. Wilde's contribution was The Picture of Dorian Gray, a book which is surely upon a high moral plane. It is interesting that Doyle should write these words after criminal trials and subsequent disgrace and imprisonment had ruined Wilde's reputation in the eyes of at least two generations. The picture of Dorian Gray was, in fact, one of Wilde's works adduced at the trials as evidence of his immorality, decadence, and perversion. Doyle's clear statement that it is a book which is surely upon a high moral plane shows, to my mind, a very deliberate siding with a name still blackened at that time by scandal in many, if not most, respectable British households. If Stoddart had secured from Oscar Wilde Dorian Gray for his magazine, what could he coax out of Conan Doyle? Another of his medieval historical tales? No, it was to be a sequel to A Study in Scarlet, the first Sherlock Holmes story, the novel that had appeared in Mrs. Beaton's Christmas Annual a year and a half earlier. This second appearance of the great detective was to be entitled The Sign of the Four, later shortened to just the sign of four. It would be the book that truly sealed the success of A Study in Scarlet, fully cemented the characters of Holmes and Watson in the public minds, and convinced Doyle that he had a hero who, as we would express it now, had legs, or perhaps we would say made him aware that he now had on his hands the beginnings of a franchise. 
The sign of four is many things. A treasure hunt, a tale of the Indian mutiny, and the siege at Agra. The horrors of the sieges at Lucknow and Chaunpur, a part of that Sepoy Rebellion, as it was also called, had, from an imperial perspective, a seismic and enduring effect on the British public and its view of itself and the world. The word Sepoy, incidentally, used often in the novel, refers to native Indian soldiers in the British Indian Army. The novel also offers romance and betrothal for Watson and a reacquaintance for us with the Baker Street Irregulars, those sharp young urchins whom Holmes uses as agile, invisible spies in the streets, alleys and wharves of London. We meet, too, Toby, the sleuthhound with the infallible nose, a breed of dog with which Holmes and other detectives are often compared. Indeed, the word sleuth derives from an old Norse word for an animal's scent or trail, from which the bloodhound and other smelling dogs got their alternative name, sleuthhounds. Then, by extension, the word sleuth began to be applied to detectives, especially literary descendants of Sherlock Holmes. Is it perhaps fanciful to suggest that, from this point onwards, some of Holmes's murmured elegance of phrasing, dressing-gown lounging, bohemian habits, and range of intellectual and artistic reference might owe a little something to Doyle's marvellous dinner companion that late August night in 1889? I am at least sure it is deliberate that Conan Doyle particularises the Langham Hotel in Mary Morstan's account of her adventures. He had much to thank the place for, and that little name-check is a graceful and grateful acknowledgement of it. So let's embark together now on the adventure of the Sign of Four. <laughs>